Hello, my name is Odette McIntyre, and I'm a Master Gardener with the Ottawa Carlton Master Gardeners. Welcome to this timely presentation by Master Gardener Candace Dressler, Overwintering Annuals. We can all agree that the weather's changing, right? The sun is already lower on the horizon, mornings are chillier, and we all know what's happening, right? Fall is upon us and the W word will follow just uh, shortly after. Uh, Candace is going to tell us what to do with these beautiful annuals we've tenderly cared for all summer so that they come back next year. This is not Candace's first rodeo. She's a known face uh, in our gardening circles. She's been gardening for over 30 years, has learned many trade secrets through trial and error, and she's here to share them. Candace lives in the Gloucester area with her hubby and loves gardening tourism when the pandemic uh, climate will allow. Um, so if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please, uh, uh, you can send them to the chat. Our master gardener buddy today is Josie Padzior and uh, she will be monitoring the chat. Um, Candace will answer the questions, your questions at the end of our presentation. Okay, and now here's Candace. To you, Hi. Candace. Hi, Odette. Thank you very much. And welcome, everyone. It's great to see you. Overwintering annuals. It seems like it's too early to be talking about this topic. I still have two of my dahlia varieties that haven't bloomed yet, but we have to start thinking about getting, getting ready to put them in. So today I'm going to talk about tender tubers and mother plants. So putting tender tubers to bed, why do we do it? Well, because we get flowers like this the next year and they're beautiful and they're really expensive if you want to keep them, if you want to buy new ones every year. So by doing a little bit of work in the fall, we get to keep those tender tubers and, uh, and have them for years to come. Another reason why we overwinter um, our annuals is we can have things like this planter. So this is a planter made up of plants that I have overwintered. In here we have impatience, we have these cannas, we have a geranium, pelagornium, um, we have this uh, German ivy, and in the back and these flowers here are a spider plant. So these are, I take this planter apart every, every fall and bring some overwinter, some in the windowsill, put some in the basement, and in the next spring I can plant up a new planter at no cost. Another reason why we overwinter is so we can have a show like this. These are the dahlias in my front yard and the cannas that are up to the roof. So how do we get, so we're going to, I'm going to talk first about the digging of the tender tubers and I'm going to talk about dahlias. So we had to have had a couple questions on the Facebook page about when do we do that? We do it after frost has damaged the leaves. And you can see in this photo from a couple of years ago, the frost has damaged the leaves here. Ideally, when this happens, you cut off the, you cut the plants off about here, about 20 centimeters above the ground. And then you leave them in the ground for a couple, for at least a few more days or as long as possible. This year we had, the year I took this picture, we'd had frost. And then we were, we were slated to have another heavy frost right away afterwards. So I dug them up right away. So there is no set rule on how long do you leave them in the ground after the first frost or after you've cut the tops off. It's as long as you can. You wanna keep the stem dry. Um, in, in this example here, you can see dahlias, as they grow, they get a hollow stem. And so if you've got one like that, you wanna put a, actually put a piece of tin foil or something over top of it so that the water won't get into the stem while it's sitting at this level um, in the ground. Minus four will kill, will kill your tubers. As I learned the hard way um, in 2018, I dug up my tubers, I cleaned them, I sorted them, I divided them and then because you wanna let them dry and cure for a few days before you package them up, I put them in the shed, thinking the shed is protected. It's only gonna be minus three or minus four tomorrow night. My shed will be warm enough. Well, I went out the next morning and they were all mush. So you want to be careful about keeping them away from that frost 
in the fall as well as as well when you get them up. So you dig them with a fork, just like potatoes. And in this picture here, you can see that they can be up to a foot away from the stem. So you put your fork in about a foot away from the from the stem. You do it gently. You want to make, and if you hit any resistance, then just pull your fork out and pull it back a little bit further and loosen your dahlias up and lift them so you can uh, so you can pull the two, pull them up in a clump like this. Then you wash them. And you can let them dry for a day or two like that. And you identify them. This is in all of the reading of, of everything that I have read, one of the most important things is to make sure you identify them. So as you can see in these clumps, this clump here, when I dug them up, I took one of the flowers and I left also all of these tubers have the have this flower on them. And so, and then you as you keep going, you identify you label them. People label them with. Um, a stick that they keep with them. Some people after they're washed will write on the tubers. You can do that with an indelible pencil, one that, one that writes on wet. Um, I, I saw them at Lee Valley or with an indelible ink um, so that you know which, which uh, tubers are the ones that you want. This year I got some yellow and white ones mixed up. So in my, in my clumps of color, I've got some no, they're the purple and reds I get mixed up. So I've got some purples where I thought I was going to have reds. It's not as important in the home garden, but um, if you're going to be sharing your tubers, people like to get the tubers that they think that, they're, that you're giving them. You shake off the loose soil, wash away any remaining soil gently, and then allow them to dry thoroughly. And you can see here, we've got another clump and you can see how they're different shapes. See, these ones look more like potatoes and these ones are longer. This picture is from this spring, um, but I just wanted to see, show you. So this spring when we talked, I told you, I, we talked about cutting the end of the, of the mother tuber off because one of the things that we do when we separate our dahlias is we're going to discard the mother tuber. We're also going to discard the feeder roots and that's all these long skinny roots. And when, because we cut the ends off of our mother tubers this spring, it, that gave us two things. It encouraged more growth from the eye, and it also will allow us to easily identify our mother tubers this fall, which I think is going to be one of the best things that we get that we get to do. Um, we've got an, another grump here, and you can see even how much longer these ones are. So when you're putting your fork in the ground, make sure that you're going far enough away, far enough away. That, uh, that you aren't gonna stab any. And if you stab one, it's just like when you stab a potato. Oh, well, you can see that we've got not lots of tubers on each group. And each one of these in my garden started out as one tuber last spring. So they do multiply generously. We're going to, so when we, after we've dug them out, we've washed them off, we've let them dry for a day or two. Now we're gonna divide them. And we're gonna discard the feeder roots and stalks. And we're going to discard the mother root, and that's the one that we cut off. And then we're going to divide into clumps. Just checking to see what I got here for pictures. So some eyes will have two tubers, and some will have one. And then after we've divided them into clumps, we may have to wash and dry them again. You'll know if there's sometimes in your clumps when you break them apart, you'll there'll be more dirt, and you want to have all of that dirt off before you store them. There could be microorganisms that can encourage, because what we're trying to do is trying to discourage and avoid rot over winter. I've got some pictures here. So here are my tubers with, we've got where we can cut the ends off and we can see these two were, these pictures were actually taken af, a couple of weeks after I had initially planted them. So we've got eyes up here, those little white, we can see a better picture of, a, of an eye. So, We've got these eyes here and you can see them up here. And we want to make sure we have eyes with a tuber to feed it. And there's two, just two times when you can divide. You can either divide in the fall or in the spring. And the reasons to divide in the fall are because they're easier to cut. Um, the, the tubers are softer, they haven't ripened, they haven't hardened up. And it, so, and it takes less room to store divided tubers than it does to store a full clump. 
but in the fall, it's harder to see the eyes. And that's what, we, what happens when we cut the tops off and we leave the tubers in the ground is they start to develop new eyes for next year. And so the longer you can leave the tubers in the ground after you've cut the tops off before frost, um, then the more likely you're gonna be able to see some eyes when, you did, when you're dividing them in the fall. This tuber is dirty because I planted it the, this spring and then dug it up so I could take pictures to show you what eyes look like. You will never have tubers that are this dirty when you're doing your division. And I just want to point out again, see where the eye is and you see there's the neck and then there's the tuber down and the, the tuber down is down here. So if you, when I, when I first looked at it, I thought, oh yeah, I'll just cut it right there because that looks like the, like the, the, logical place where you would cut it but no you have to keep this part above the neck of the tuber because that's where the new plant growth comes after you've divided your divided your uh, tubers what i do is i put them in bags um, and this is a picture i showed you this spring before i took them uh, took them out i label my bags of what flower is in each is in each bag um, and then i put them in a in an insulated um, box. I use vermiculite. I, and it's a good idea to use ha about the same amount of in volume of vermiculite as you have of tubers. Make sure you dust your tubers with sulfur and put the, keep them in a cardboard box. Um, other people can, you can use other things to store your tubers in. Some people use bulb bags. Um, the American Dahlia Society suggests that you wrap them in, in like saran wrap and clear cellophane. Um, I've tried different ways. Um, I, when I first started, I packed them in peat moss and I found that they were more likely to have early growth in the spring. And so then I'd have growth off of the eyes. And if you have growth off the eyes in the spring, when you unpack the boxes, you're very likely to have them break. So after trial and error, um, I've decided that vermiculite with some dusting of sulfur is what is giving me the, has given me the best results with the least amount of rot and the best growth in the next spring. You need to store them in a dry, cool, frost-free area um, between five and 10 degrees Celsius. What I've done, um, what, I use, what I try and do is I'll put them in the garage and then I'll watch. And last winter, there were three days where my garage was, was at zero or below zero. So because I have them in an insulated box, I just, I brought them into the house for three days um, into a cooler spot in the house. And then when the temperature went back, I put them back out in the garage. If you have a cool spot in your basement, that's perfect. Um, you don't want to put your cardboard box directly on concrete because actually concrete will suck the moisture out of the box um, and take that moisture out of your out of your uh, out of your tubers. It is a good idea to check them for rot. Um, you want to check them two or three times over the winter. Open up your bags. You can feel if they're rotten when you pick up the bag. It'll be soft. You'll know it's pretty obvious. It's like if you have rotten, a rotten potato, you can tell as soon as you touch the bag if there's something in there that's soft and getting ready to rot. So here's my box ready to, uh, ready to go to be stored. So that's dahlias. The other, the other tubers that I store are cannas. And you do the same thing with cannas as you do for, for dahlias. You wait until the frost kills the leaves. Cannas Cannas are easier to store than dahlias. Cannas are tougher than dahlias. Cannas are, um, cannas are a perennial plant on Vancouver Island. So they can survive a colder temperature. The same with your dahlias, you dig them with a fork, you wash them, you dry them, you cut them to a plant sized tuber. Um, and then, and again, I pack them in sulfur and vermiculite in a cardboard box and they can be a little bit cooler, four to 10 degrees. Um, and these I don't put in individual bags because I have, I only have, I have three different varieties of cannas that I store. So I put each one in its own box. Uh, they're, and they store, they, I just throw them in the garage and don't worry about them. Cause they can, if it gets to minus five, 
they're fine. They're going to give you, uh, they're going to last much better. So that's it for, for tubers. The other, the, the other plants that um, I, I, we had in the planter were in patients. And this is another reason why you might want to overwinter your plants. This impatience is, an, is one that is no longer available on the market. A few years ago, there was a really bad virus that hit impatience. And for quite a few years, you couldn't get them at all. They are slowly coming back to the market. This is one that one of my neighbors got from a lady who used to have a TV show on gardening in Ottawa. So it was probably purchased 20 years ago. Uh, and it uh, it keeps just keeps growing and growing and and producing year after year. As well, this Pelagonium is a heritage variety. It's a dark red. It's got velvet flower, velvety flowers, and it's not a variety. And it is a uh, it's one that's not readily available in the stores anymore. I think one of my aunts still has one of my grandmother's grandmother's Pelagoniums. So. You know, they are something that can be passed down within families and, and you just have the same ones year after year. So there's two methods for, for keeping these plants. You can use a mother plant and where you cut, back, cut the plant back in the fall by a third to a half, you repot it. And the reason why you're going to repot it is to get rid of any insects that might be in the soil that you don't want in your house for the winter. Um, so if you have a... a solarium where you're going to store it, it might not be as important to repot it, but giving it fresh soil helps it over the winter as well. For the winter, you water it sparingly, and then you take cuttings in, in February, um, or you just trim it back and you keep that plant and you just use the same plant over and over again. You can keep them in a cool, sunny window still, still or you can keep them under lights. The other way you can do it is to take fall cuttings. So you'll take cuttings. You could have taken cuttings like the end of July, you can start, but over the next, from so definitely within the next week or two, you wanna finish taking cuttings. Um, Rob gave an excellent talk last week on taking cuttings. So you just follow his, uh, his instructions for taking uh, from last week for taking soft cuttings. Trim it back before you take it in. I actually did this this morning. Um, so this was my pelagonium, my impatience plant. And so I've cut it back. I've taken the flowers off. I've reduced it um, by a significant amount. Then those pieces that I've cut off, I I took and I put them in water because impatience will, will root very easily in water. And so that will give us a, a good start. And or with your pelagonium, this is a this is a six year old pelagonium that has just been brought in, cut back, overwintered in, in the windowsill. Um, it gets a, and you have to realize they're going to get a little bit leggy, and you can actually see on these impatience plants. See here, there's a there's a node, and then there's a node, and then there's a node. So those this should have been cut back this spring, because those are winter nodes, and then up here at the top. The nodes are much closer together. Those are summer growth. In the summer, when there's sun, the plant is going to produce um, its leaves much closer together. When it's not getting as much light when it's in the house, it's going to be stretching for the light and there's going to be more space between, between the nodes. Um, and that's how, and so we cut it off. So I cut them back about here and put them in some water, some rooting compound and I'll plant those up and put them in the windowsill for next year and then they'll go. And so this is the pelagonium in the windowsill and it's just in a small pot. If you've got a windowsill, you can line your windowsill with them. And that's another um, reason, another uh, input into what, to, what method you choose. If you have one spot where you can easily store a mother plant, until you're ready to pot up in the spring, then you do that. If you have a windowsill like mine, where there's room for cuttings, let's see, it's not very wide, but I don't really have room for a big for a big planter like this one, then you take cuttings. There isn't really one, the reasons why you would do one other than the other aren't, 
or, or some years I have better success with the mother plant and some years I have better success with cuttings. So sometimes I do both. Um, there really isn't a right or a wrong way. It's just whatever is going to work for you. And that's my talk. And I'm open for questions. A lot of this information is on the web. There are hundreds of videos about how to bring in dahlias and divide dahlias. So I was, I was thinking that one of the best things we could do today is spend some time answering questions. But I see that there are no questions in the chat. So please give us some questions. Okay. Yes. Well, I have a question. Uh, in the beginning, you referred to tender tubers. I assume that means the tubers that can't take any frost at all? Yes. Or, so yeah. cannas and dahlias are both tropical plants. Um, I know dahlias are from Mexico. I'm not sure where cannas are from. And so, yeah, any frost in the ground at all, and they're going to die. And like I said, in my shed, it hit minus four, and they they died. They all went mushy. I guess so it doesn't take very much frost at all for them to to uh, give up. Give in. I guess there aren't really any other options if you don't have cold storage and you don't and your garage is too cold. Um, yeah, it, I guess you really can't overwinter these tubers then. No, no, no. Yeah, well, yeah, you, like yeah, it's it gets tricky. You have sometimes you have a bit of in and out, um, but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it can be, I have stored them in the basement where my, ba and my basement can, is a bit warm. Uh, so it runs about, I would say it runs about 10 degrees. No, it's warmer than that. It's about, it's about 15 degrees over the winter and they're okay. They'll, they'll survive. A little bit warmer is better than, than cold. Okay, thank you. And uh, Kimberly is asking uh, about iris plants. Are they considered tubers? And if so, how do you dig it up and replant? So irises are tubers, but they're tough buggers. <laughs> They've, I've dug up irises and, and left them on top of the soil and forgotten about them. And then the next year they've bloomed. So they do not, you can just, you just leave them outside because um, they don't even want to be covered. They don't even want to have the tops of them covered. So you just leave them outside and they will bloom for you next year. If you were to dig, you can dig them and replant them now. Yeah, now is a good time if you want to move them. Obviously you don't want to move them in the spring when they're going to be blooming. So if you want to move them in your garden, now is the time to dig them up and replant them, but leave them outside. Um, Odette is asking if you have any ideas about overwintering Dracaenas. So that's why I use a spider plant in my, in my planters, because I have not had any luck bringing in the Dracaenas. I have tried many times. I have Dracaenas, Dracaena house plants, but the ones that they sell to be those big plumy things in the planters, I have never had any luck. So I have my, my spider plant. I, in my, in my, where was it? Where's my planter here? I'm gonna go back to the planter. So I have the spider plant in the back here with its flowers. And it um it gives me it gives it does the same thing as a dracaena in a planter. And I just dig it out of here. I'll and I'll divide it into a couple small pots to put to keep in the house over winter and I use it instead. Okay, thank you. And is the method the same for calla lilies as for cannas? Calla, the people that I know that have calla lilies that, that bring them in, um, keep them, no, they don't, they just keep the, bring the plants in like this, like a spider plant and just re put it, take it out of whatever they have it in, in outside and keep it in the pot and keep it alive over the winter. I haven't had a whole lot of luck with calla lilies. Actually, I failed so that I don't, I gave up, but I do have a friend who has them planted right next to her house and they survive outside. So I would think that they would be very similar, but I would, I, they're going to like a cool area for the, they're going to prefer cool for the winter, but you could, I would try just bringing it in and treating it like a house plant. Okay. Heather is bemoaning the fact that uh, she has a heated basement <laughs> and a detached shed same problem as me and, and 
and looking for a space to keep cannas. Yeah, your can is the... seriously asking, but yeah. maybe the cannas the cannas are more forgiving. Um, so if you put them in your basement and you don't put them on and you put them close to the floor, some in in the I mean it's mine's mine's heated too so just put them in the coolest spot put them in a in a in a room where the keep the door closed where there's no direct heat going in and they should they should be okay okay now no, i'm not sure what this question exactly means i i do because <laughs> <laughs> the sure. impatience plants are notorious for white fly ah. so that's why so i when i bring them in i wash the plant off that's why you repot them because um, you're trying to get rid of all of those little fly eggs before before you bring them in for the winter. Um, right. I do end up having to use some insecticidal soap on them a couple times through the winter. But if I find if I replace the soil and wash the plant well before I bring it in, it's going to do better. Okay. And um, or hmm, somebody planted, Karen planted two dahlia tubers in the spring that looked okay, but did nothing when planted. Uh, so are there any typical things one might do wrong? Sure. So I'm going to, I'm going to go back here. So you need the eyes. Actually, the other picture was better. Let's see. Come here. This one. Okay. So you need these eyes. So what probably happened is when you divided your tuber and cut it, you cut it, you cut it here and you didn't get these eyes um, because they're, they're more like they're, they're, they want to break here um, and you need to get these eyes. The other thing is that you may have, um, you may have, they may have lost the, the the nutrients in the tuber, but the most likely thing is you didn't get in you didn't get any eyes when you when you cut. Okay, thank you. And Oriental lily is not the kind that you bring in. I don't know what an Oriental lily is. Yeah. Oh. Can you can you be a little more, more clear about well, what you uh... the, the Asian Asian type lilies that used to be attacked by the red lily beetle, but seem to be okay oh, now yeah i just leave my i have the i have those and i leave them outside mm -hmm. i don't bring them in at all they're 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 hardy and um okay somebody uh, nora plant i planted my dahlias indoors and they got very leggy by the time i put them outside do you ever start them indoors before spring i do start them indoors before spring and i used to because i was all excited and, and uh, over anxious. I started them as early as, as the end of February. And I have learned my lesson. I now start them mid to mid April. Um, and I put them in soil, I put them on the, on the ground, and I give them lots of sun. Um, as soon as it's light enough, I put them outside so they so that they're getting that light. And I put them what I what I did this year is I when we remodeled our bathroom we put in heated floors in the bathroom and I put them on those heated floors and that has meant that they were so happy they bloomed so fast and were so much bushier than they had ever been before so if you are lucky enough to have heated floors mm -hmm. plant, put them in their pots and put them on your heated floors and they'll grow for you, but don't do it too early because yes, they will get they will get leggy. Um, if you go back into the trial talk uh, archive, live archive, I did give a talk in spring about uh, starting them indoors for the spring. We have time for one more question. Okay, here's a question about can white flies survive outside in the winter? She's wondering if she needs to worry about infestation in the garden beds and pots outside. Don't worry about uh, don't worry about the white flies outside in the way. I mean, they're 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 there now, um, and but because there's so many things that eat them, that it's not an issue. Okay, 
Okay. Very good. Okay, it's time to say thanks to Candice for providing expert advice today on overwintering annuals. I think um, there's a few more things that I've added to my to-do list. So thank you, Candice. Uh, so thanks also to Josie for handing the questions. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in today. And um, I invite you to join us again next week for another Trowel Talk live presentation on a really awesome topic. And it's uh, micro, uh, micro greens with uh, Nancy McDonald. So have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.